Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn from the misfortunes of others. To help increase your legal knowledge, please hit the subscribe button. For today's case, we have United States of America versus Malik Gumezi. In this case, Gumezi was driving a car without, uh, without tags on it, and the police opened the door to lean in to talk to him. But maybe that was a violation of the Fourth Amendment. They also found a weapon in his car, and now they're trying to prosecute him for it. So the question is, did the police conduct an unlawful search and seizure? Let's get started with this. The search at issue occurred in the early morning hours of May the 6th, 2018, after San Francisco police officer Colby Wilmes saw Gomez's car parked at a gas station with Gomez's in the driver's seat. The car had no license plate, an apparent violation of the California Vehicle Code. Gomez had recently purchased the car, and a bill of sale was affixed to the lower passenger side corner on the windshield. So the officer didn't see the plates, and it didn't have plates, but it was lawfully driving because it just purchased the car, and he had a bill of sale attached to it. And so we had this, this it, it was authorized to be on the road, but the officer didn't initially see that. Wilmes approached the car to investigate because a gas pump blocked access to the driver's side, and he went into the passenger side. According to Gomez, Wilms then opened the passenger door, leaned into the car, and asked Gomez for his driver's license and vehicle registration. For his part, Wilmes agrees that he asked Gomez for the license and registration and does not deny that he first opened the door and leaned inside. So the police officer is conducting this investigation at this gas pump. The guy is getting gas. He sees it doesn't have tags on it, and he wants to investigate. So the driver's side is, bro is blocked by the gas, and so he goes around the passenger side. And here's the critical part. He opens the door and leans into the car. So that might be an invalid search at that point. And so maybe everything that flows from it is also invalid. So we have to get into what the police officer did or did not observe, what their lawful permissions were or were not, and also what the U.S. government argued, because the way the U.S. government argued this case is a bit bizarre. Gomez produced a California identification card, but not a driver's license. Wilms asked Gomez if the license was suspended, and Gomez admitted that it was. So now he's admitting to driving without a valid license. So that's a problem. On his brand new car, incidentally, one wonders how the dealership or whoever gave it to him decided to do that, but whatever. So San Francisco Police Department policy requires officers to inventory and tow a vehicle when the driver lacks a valid license and has at least one prior citation for driving without a license. So this is not his first time doing this. Consistent with policy, the officer prepared to have the car towed. In conducting the inventory search, which you do after you normally take the car, so you do an inventory search to see what's in the car, they found a located, they found a loaded 45 caliber handgun under the driver's seat. The officers then ran a, ran a background check and learned that Gomez was prohibited from possessing firearms because of a previous felony conviction. So this guy's day just gets worse and worse. He, 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 the car is towed and inventoried. His brand new car is towed and inventoried and it found that he has a weapon in the car, one that he's not allowed to have because he's a felon. Also, he's in San Francisco. So, you know, there's that, but whatever. Gomez was charged with one count of being a felon of possession in firearm in violation of federal law. He moved to suppress the firearm as fruit of an unlawful search. So he says, okay, uh, the way that they came into this knowledge was unlawful. So the inventory search is proper as part of the seizure, right? So that part is proper. But whether or not the car could be seized is the question. And the only reason that you could seize it is because he didn't have a driver's license. And the only reason you knew he had a driver's license is because you leaned in the car and asked. And so maybe this whole thing is fruit of a poisonous tree or not. So what is the law as it relates to this? And what is the U.S. government's position? Let's press on. On appeal, Gumezi challenges only the denial of the motion to suppress, which we review de novo from the very beginning. His principal argument is that is, is whether or not Officer Wilms had reasonable suspicion at the time he opened the door. Opening the door and leaning inside constitute a search that violated the Fourth Amendment because it was not authorized by any exception to the war warrant requirement. So Gumezi says that you didn't have reason to open my door and that constituted a search. Okay. So the court says, as we've explained, the district court focused on a different argument. The reasonable suspicion should have been dispelled because the bill of sale was visible in the windshield. 
and did not address the argument that opening the door and leaning inside was itself a law unlawful search. So the district court focused on the issue of, well, there was a bill of sale, so they didn't have reasonable suspicion. And it didn't address the argument that opening the door itself was an unlawful search. And the Court of Appeals says, we can hardly fault the district court for ignoring that particular issue because Guzmezi raised it only in a footnote in reply in support of his motion to suppress. We've held that perfunctory requests buried among footnotes does not preserve an argument for appeal. So Guzmez, Guzmezi is in trouble. Guzmezi is in trouble. The district court focused on, wait a second, the officer, this, this thing had a uh, bill of sale, so we didn't have cause to search. But maybe the officer didn't see it. So maybe that's the issue. That's what the district court focused on. Entirely separate issue, did you have cause to open the door? But Guzmezi didn't preserve the issue for appeal. He only mentioned it as an aside and a footnote. That is not going to do the trick. So as we've discussed on this channel, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So he didn't raise the issue on appeal. So he lost the issue on appeal. Or did he? Because if you don't use it, you lose it does apply to both sides of the case. Hmm. Thus, had the government argued the issue was forfeited, we would have been compelled to agree. In that case, we could have only considered Gumezi's argument only if he had showed good cause for not properly raising it. So if the government had mentioned, you use it, you lose it, we would have agreed, you lose it, you lose it. But, but, the government did not make this argument. They didn't use it, they lose it. Instead, they address the issue of the merits and invite us to do so as well. Therefore, we conclude the government has forfeited the claim of forfeiture. So we proceed on the merits. So this is just super interesting world. So the, the defendant over here failed to raise a critical legal issue. And all the government had to do is say they failed to raise a critical legal issue, but they failed to raise that critical legal issue. So they lost it. So it's not forfeited. So it continues to exist. So now we have to actually consider it. Way to go, federal government. That, that, was, that was good. They lost the issue. You lost the issue. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's do the merits then. In addressing the merits, we assume, as the district court did, that Gumezi's version of the facts are correct, because the key facts are not disputed. Gumezi stated that Wilms opened the car door and leaned into the car, and Wilms does not specifically deny that's what he did, so they kind of agree on that. We therefore must consider whether officers who have reasonable suspicion to justify a traffic stop, but who lack probable cause or any other particularized justification, such as reasonable belief that the driver poses danger, may open the door to a vehicle and lean inside, we conclude they may not. Yeah, so this is just, this is the most bizarre thing I think I've seen in recent memory. So did you have reasonable articulable suspicion, which is generally all you need for a traffic stop? Yes, you had reasonable articulable suspicion. What was a reasonable articulable suspicion? He didn't have plates on his car. Now, as it turns out, he was driving lawfully. Well, he, he wasn't because he didn't have a valid license. But the car wasn't unlawful. He was unlawful. The car wasn't unlawful, though. So the officer may not have noticed this thing. And so that, but so they at least had reasonable articulable suspicion to conduct it because the, the, the bill of sale was on the front windshield, right? And there were no plates on the back. So if he's coming out from the back, he doesn't see the plates on the back. He comes out around from the side to get to the passenger. He never sees it on the window. Plausible, plausible. He maybe never sees it. So he has reasonable articulable suspicion to conduct the traffic stop. But when he opens the door and leans inside, he has crossed the threshold of the car. That's a property law violation, as we learned from Jones from the seizure. So now he has seized the car by opening the door and leaning inside because he has crossed the threshold. He has now seized the car. So now he needs probable cause. Did he have probable cause? No. Therefore, it was unlawful. And we wouldn't have said this if you had just U.S. government said he forfeited the argument. If only you had said he hadn't forfeited the argument, we wouldn't be writing this. But you didn't mention it. So now we're writing it. Way to go, U.S. government. That's just, that's just top work there. 
The Supreme Court, in a prior case called Class, established that a physical intrusion into the interior of a car constitutes a search. Once you're inside the car, you have conducted a search for which you need probable cause, as the Fourth Amendment teaches. Although the search in the case of Class was justified because of a particularized need, finding the VIN number, which was on inside door jam, and the one that was on the, the windshield was not visible, and because it was minimally intrusive. Those, but neither of those considerations is present here. You weren't trying to find the VIN. There was nothing you were trying to do in particular other than open the door and lean inside for its own sake. Uh-oh. The government has pointed to no justification for the search. Anything would have been fine, but you didn't point to any. It is not argued that Wilms had probable cause, nor is it suggested that Wilms had any reason to fear that Gumezi might be dangerous. So there was a prior Supreme Court case that said, under a case called Class, that said, yes, once you intrude into the car, that is a search. Now, there might be many reasons to conduct a search. You know, many, many, many reasons to conduct a search. Did you have any of those reasons? <sighs> no, you didn't. So you have conducted an unlawful search. We wouldn't be writing this if you had merely said he forfeited the argument so he lost it, but for reasons that pass our understanding, you didn't bring that up. So now we're having to write this, that you conducted an illegal search. Great. So the defendant, the defendant committed an unforced error, and then the U.S. government convicted, conducted an unforced error. So, yeah, good times. The government argues that Gumezi would have had to speak with Wilmes one way or another. First of all, no, he doesn't because he has the right to remain silent, but whatever. And therefore, opening the door and leaning in was minimally intrusive because it's a practical matter. It didn't alter Gumezi's circumstances. It merely facilitated communication. Now, it analogizes Wilmes' action to that of shining of a flashlight into a car, which the Supreme Court has held is not a search. Yes, because there's no physical intrusion. Light enters cars normally because they have windows so merely shining a flashlight is not enough however however you did more that reasoning is flawed because it ignores that the officer entered the interior space of the car when he leaned in across the plane of the door you have crossed the threshold sir you have crossed the threshold you are now inside the car oops as several recent Supreme Court decisions have confirmed, physical intrusion is constitutionally significant. When the government obtains information by physically intruding on persons, houses, papers, or fact, that is a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment, and it has undoubtedly occurred. We, we wouldn't be writing this if you had merely said he forfeited the argument for never bringing it up. We wouldn't be writing this. But for some reason, you never mentioned it. So now we're writing this. Way to go, U.S. government. That's just genius work. So now we have to say it's an unreasonable search because you're an idiot. Way to go. Although the intrusion here may have been modest, the Supreme Court has never suggested that the magnitude of the intrusion is relevant. It's not because it's trespass as we learned from the case of Jones. Jones, for example, involved the attachment of a small GPS tracker. It was small and light, and it didn't interfere with the car's operation. But yet, but yet, the court held that it was a search because it was a physical trespass. You have trespassed upon the car, sir. You have entered the car, sir. You have trespassed. You have broken the hold. You have broken the clothes of the car. You are now inside the car. You are conducting a search. It may be minimal, but you're there. Congratulations, you done played yourself. The government argues that under Pennsylvania versus MIMS, an officer may, as a matter of course, order a driver to lawfully exit the vehicle. That's true. Yeah, you could have ordered him to exit the car. That is a thing you could have done. However, it is not a thing that you did do. And then the court notes that even if opening the door and leaning into the car is a lesser intrusion on liberty, 
which maybe it is because, you know, ordering someone to physically move, maybe that's a greater intrusion on liberty than merely opening the door and leaning in. So one could make a colorable argument that this is less intrusive on liberty. You're not requiring the person to do anything. So his liberty interests are more preserved. That's colorable. But even if it's true that it's less intrusive on liberty, it is, however, a greater intrusion on the privacy interests of the car. So you may not have intruded on the person, but you intruded on the car. Way to go. Property interest, Jones, trespass, trespass to chattel. Way to go. Just top-notch work. Indeed, the court emphasized in MIM that a driver ordered out of a car is being asked to expose very little more than is already exposed. Yeah, we're only asking you to, to stand up outside, which we could already see you. So we're not really searching anything because we could already see you through the glass. So we're not really searching you at that point because, you know, we could see you. But what we did instead was we leaned into the car. Way to go. Because opening the door and leaning in, you know, just because you leaned in, man, you crossed the, thre you crossed the threshold, you crossed the plane of the door. Because it is an unlawful search, and we wouldn't be writing this if you didn't make us, but now we're here, we must consider what remedy is appropriate. So what should we do about it? That's always a good thing to do. What should we do about the problem? Okay, the exclusionary rule generally applies in Fourth Amendment cases and generally requires courts to suppress any events obtained as a direct result of an illegal search or seizure. Uh-oh. As well as evidence later discovered, and found to be derivative of that illegality, the so-called fruit of the poisonous tree. Uh-oh. So when we conduct an illegal search, we normally suppress all the things we found in the search and all the things that derived from that search. Uh-oh. So the moment we poked our head into the car, we've conducted a search. That's when we found out he didn't have a license. That's when we ordered the car to be towed. That's when we conducted an inventory search. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, man. Here, the evidence sought to be suppressed is the gun, which was found under the seat. Officer Williams said he didn't see the gun when he leaned into the car. He only found it during the subsequent inventory search. Uh-oh. Which he conducted because... Gumezi's suspended license required the car to be impounded. Gumezi contends the gun is never less fruit of, voice of, of the unlawful search because if he not leaned into the car, Gumezi might have well been less intimidated, and he could have directed Wilms to the bill of sale on the windshield, dispelling any suspicion, and, and ending the encounter before the police officer learned of the suspended license. So if he hadn't violated my rights, maybe I could direct him to the bill of sale, and he would have been like, oh, okay, you're good to go. The fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine does not require a particularly tight causal chain between illegal search and discovery of the evidence to be suppressed. So it doesn't have to be like really tight. It can be kind of loose. It doesn't, it can be infinitely loose, but if it's derivative, you may have a problem. Even so, we may have some doubts as to whether or not it can accommodate this chain with so many speculative links as Numezis. Okay. All right. So we're on, we're on to saving grace number two. Okay. So you never argued, government, that about the whole they forfeited the trespass argument. It's okay. It's okay, government. It's okay. Because, you know, fruit of the poisonous tree, fruit of the poisonous tree doesn't extend forever. So, you know, maybe, maybe we can get past this issue and we can say, you know, it was an illegal search, but it's just too proximately disconnected. You know, it's too disconnected. So Maybe this search is okay. Maybe we can make that argument. Can we, can we do that? Can we do that? No, we can't. Because, because face palming, the court face palms now, because the government has the burn to show that Evans is not of the fruit of the poisonous tree and the government has made no effort to do so. Oh no. Wah, wah, wah. So all you had to do was argue they forfeited the claim. No, we're not going to make that argument. Uh, okay. Uh, would you like to make the argument that it's approximately disconnected? No, we have no interest in that argument either. Okay. You don't want to argue it's approximately disconnected? Uh, okay. Then I guess it's not approximately disconnected. 
it, it must be derivative of the search. I mean, you could have argued it's approximately disconnected. We're just kind of handing it to you, but you don't want to take that? Uh, uh, okay, U.S. government. Um, uh, I, okay, it's not approximately disconnected then. It's fruit of the poisonous tree. Uh, all right, good. In addition, despite the fact that it would seem to be plausible that the gun would have been discovered even without the constitutional violation. Okay. The government has not argued inevitability. Bite number three at the apple. Bite number three at the apple. Okay. It's okay. It's still okay. It's still okay. It's still good. It's still good. Okay. You violated his rights. Uh, uh, you didn't have to make, the, you could have made the argument you didn't, but okay. Um, it's not approximately disconnected. Uh, well, oh, it is, but you, you couldn't have made that argument. Okay. There's one more left. It's inevitable. We would have found it in, anyway. We would have found it anyway. Would you like to make the inevitability argument? Would you like to make the argument we would have found it no matter what? No? You wouldn't like to make the inevitability argument? Uh, uh, oh, okay. So you don't want to argue we would have found it no matter what. So our illegal conduct is irrelevant. You don't want to make the inevitability argument? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, all right. Um, so the government has the burden to show inevitable discovery. So its failure to make that argument prevents us from upholding the denial of the suppression motion on that theory. Strike number three, government, you could have, you could have, you could have, you could have argued he lost the argument, but you didn't want to make that argument. You could have argued it was approximately disconnected. Didn't want to make that argument. You could have argued it was inevitable. Didn't want to make that argument. Okie doke. Um, uh, all right, let's just continue pressing on then. Therefore, because the U.S. government failed to make any of these arguments, even though they probably could have, we reverse the denial of the motion to suppress, we vacate the conviction, and we remand for further proceedings. Thus, that brings us to the end of our discussion of United States of America versus Malik Gumezi, who is the luckiest guy on the face of the earth. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.